All right, so I have just re started the recording. Can I just get a quick check that I that you guys can still hear me because of the net? Uh, yeah, I, oh, yeah, well, there, yeah, I can still nope. hear you. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Yep. Sometimes your voice fades, but it's you yeah. can still hear you. Okay, that's yeah. Good, you're all good on my end. Perfect. Thanks. All right. So before we begin, mm -hmm. I want to tell you guys <laughs> that we're going to be in Romans chapter twelve and 13 today. They're really short chapters and not as theologically dense as the other ones. So let's start in first with the usual summary that we always do. We're going to start in Romans chapter 1. And Paul starts in, he says, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. And then Paul goes ahead and says that he would like to visit Rome someday. And we learned that in chapter 1. In chapter 1, 16 to 17, we have Paul's thesis, and this is what he's going to defend. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, and he defines it as the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then he goes on, and he doesn't talk about the gospel exactly. He doesn't talk about how we receive the gospel. He talks about why we need the gospel. 118, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all impiety and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Then we go on from 118 all the way to the end of the chapter there. He's talking mainly about Gentiles. Gentiles are condemned. Then in chapter 2 he says, mainly the Jews, the hypocrites, they are also Condemned. Then finally in chapter 3, he brings those two group, groups together and he says that everybody is condemned. Everyone is under sin for we, we have already charged both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Verse 9, then verse 10, just as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. And that is chapter 3. So everyone's under sin, everyone's condemned, therefore people need justification. And if you want to learn about more about, about justification, you can check out my paper on justification that I recently wrote for my Romans class, 10-page paper. It's in the personal writing tab. So just a little plug there if you want to learn about justification. So Romans chapter 3, 21 to 5 is mainly about how we receive that justification, how we appropriate that. Starting at verse 23 there in chapter 3, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace, that's being declared righteous and being reconciled to God, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God made publicly available as the propitiation through faith in His blood. And that is extremely important there, through faith in his blood. And that is how you receive that justification. That's how God declares you righteous. So that's chapter 3. We move on to chapter 4, which is about Abraham. And Paul talks about Abraham being the father of the circumcised and uncircumcised. All you need is to walk in his steps in faith. And you can be a child of Abraham and be an heir with Abraham as well. So we move on to chapter 5, which is again about reconciliation with Christ. A verse that's important to note there is verse 12. Because of this, just as sin entered into the world through one man and death through sin, so also death spread to all people because all sinned. And we learn more about original sin and what that means, how death spread to all people in our chapter 5 Bible study. After that, we looked at chapters 6 to 8, which is more about godly living, the way of godliness. All right, we know that people are condemned and we know how to be justified. That is through faith. What therefore shall we say? Verse 1 of chapter 6, shall we continue in sin in order that grace may increase? May it never be. And that is how we live in godliness. We do not continue to live in sin, but we live as if we have died to sin because we have died to sin. That's chapter 6 and 7. And then in chapter 8, we have some very encouraging words, especially near to the end of that chapter there. Let's start at verse 29. Because those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So when you are called, if you are called, then you are guaranteed all the way to glorification. And verse 37 there, No, but in all these things we prevail completely through the one who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor anything 
present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Very encouraging words there. In chapters 9 to 11, we look at Israel's place, specifically Israel's place in the redemption plan of God. It seems that the Jews have all fallen away, and it seems that the Gentiles are now being brought in. They're now the new thing. So what happened about all well, the Israelites? What happened to them? Did God's word fail? Did God's plan fail because he chose the Israelites and now they're falling away? Paul says, may it never be. Of course not. And then he tells us that God has actually saved a remnant from these Jews and that he's bringing the Gentiles in to provoke the Jews to jealousy. That's chapters, mainly chapter 11 there, but 9 and 10 are also on that same thing. And we talked about predestination and election in chapter 9, the implications of that, and some Armenian possibilities as well. So that's 9 to 11. And then we move on for today's study, which is going to be in chapters 12 to 13. And it's a common sort of trend with Paul, common outline for a number of his books like Thessalonians as well. For example, he starts out with all this theology and then near the end of the book, he gives us these practical applications to easily apply these, these theological principles to our lives. And that's going to be chapters 12 and 13. So this is going to be about practical stuff. So would anybody like to read for us chapter 12 verses... Actually, just the whole chapter 12. Any volunteers? And it looks like I have just disconnected. I can, if you'd like. Yeah, that would be perfect. Cool, okay. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us if your gift is prophesying then prophecy in accordance or then prophesy in accordance with your faith if it is serving then serve if it is teaching then teach if it is to encourage then give encouragement if it is giving then give generously if it is to lead do it diligently if it is to show mercy do it cheerfully Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual uh, fervor to serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who are or bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Perfect. Thanks. All right. So that was a big section. So I just want to quickly outline what Paul went through there. He first started in with humility, and then he went into unity, and he talked a little bit about gifts, and then virtues, and then some practical advice for us. All right, that has not worked out, sadly. The recording's still going, so I will continue this study on by myself just for the recording here. 
And for everyone watching this recording, please pray for my internet. It's really bad on this tiny island in the Philippines that isn't officially supported by any internet providers right now. So please pray for that and thank you. All right, so chapter 12 was thankfully read by Cinebred. His name was Matthew. And we will go on here. And my question is, what does it mean to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, first and foremost? Um, well, uh, in the scripture here, it says to uh, give blessings to your enemies. So I guess, uh, in a sense to me, it would show that uh, to sort of go against our human nature, in a sense, as a gull. God calls us to do it because uh, I guess naturally we kind of want to be mean to people who are mean to us as a defense mechanism. But uh, God says to be loving to those who hate you and to show them kindness. And that kind of ties into how it's a uh, living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Because uh, if if we're going to have our bodies in a place where it's sort of a, a not a good temple if we're leading sinful lives then we cannot be uh, pleasing to God because we are uh, because we are leading ourselves into sort of dirty uh, waters there, if you will. After Paul talks about unity, he then goes on and talks a little bit about these different gifts over here. So a few of them, most of them, in fact, seem to be, you know, fairly not extraordinary you know we got service here we got teaching we got exhorting or encouraging we got giving leading and mercy what if you don't know what your gift is like how can you be like an instrument of god to like serve him their fathers that's a good question um i guess thinking about it i would see it as like of course it's something you got to ask god to do because if you're wondering how you would be an instrument for God, there's no way you're going to find out on your own because that's something God reveals to you. But in finding that, it's just a matter of prayer and how you're handling your relationship with God, going to Him every single day. The thing I can add to that is a lot of times you are contributing um, to God, but without even knowing it, as long as you have Him in your heart, as long as um, you're following His Word, you're following His law, you're following the wisdom, and when you make these different choices, you stand out in the crowd against people that are non-believers, and um, <clears throat> just you being that people notice, and you're being a reflection of God. And that makes yeah. people curious and start asking questions. So as long as you represent God, I feel like you're contributing. But the first gift there is a little more extraordinary than the other ones. And it's the gift of prophecy that Paul talks about here. And it's according to the proportion of the prophet's faith. And my question here is, all right, about this prophecy, is this like prophesying the future? You know, is this a gift that still applies today? And to answer this question, I would point out that prophecy simply, in this, in this context at least, it simply means speaking forth the words of God. And you can take this in a more, slightly more mundane sense in that, well, the prophet could speak forth the words of God that were simply written by God already in, in Scripture. So this would be like your average preacher who's simply expositing from the word, simply reading from the Bible and prophesying in that manner. And there's also the other sense that this could be taken in. This could be prophesying the future and what God's will is for the future and things like that. And just to fill in time a bit, the commentary has some interesting notes on this as well. So there could be some dangers in here because anybody could claim to be a prophet, right? And that is a danger. However, we do have some safeguards against that. Perhaps what decides the point is the way prophecy was in fact practiced. Paul tells us that two or three would prophesy and the others would weigh carefully what is said. 1 Corinthians 14, 29 there. Let two or three prophets speak and the others evaluate. It is clear that the early church was well aware of the danger of false prophets. There must be a testing of the spirits and it is some of such process of which Paul appears to be speaking of here. So that's always important to keep in mind when we look at the gift of prophecy, however way you take it as, if you think it's more of a regular preaching thing or if it's a little more supernatural and extraordinary. 
something that I found pretty interesting about the passage that was just read is how at the uh, at the end here it says, "Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written." It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's referencing a proverb in chapter 25 there. So what do you guys think that's sort of saying there at all? It's always just... about doing good versus like what your enemies are doing. Don't mind what they're doing, whether they're bullying, they're picking on someone, they're treating you wrong. You're always going to be ahead of them because we got God. We got God on our back. And so whenever, whatever they're doing, we're always going to be better than them. We're not going to stoop low to where they are. What does it mean like hips calls of fire, the fires on his head? So there's a few different things that this could mean. Heaping burning coals on his head. And I had those highlighted in yellow here. So first, the thought then would be that by doing your enemy kindness, you were increasing his guilt and magnifying his punishment. The problem with this, though, is that most commentators, it seems like an impossible way of understanding this passage. The context is dominated by thoughts of love, and indeed the whole paragraph is an expression of what Christian love means in practice. So if the goal is to magnify their punishment somehow, that doesn't sound very loving, you know? So the next option we have for reasons like this, most agree that something like Moffat's translation gives the sense of it. For in this way, you will make them feel a burning sense of shame. So those coals are symbolic of this burning sense of shame that they receive when you act kindly toward them in response to their evil toward you. The other option that we have here is by William Classen who points to some attested Egyptian literature. In the Egyptian literature and in Proverbs, the coals of fire is a dynamic symbol of change of mind, which takes place as a result of a deed of love. So it talks about the the penitent person who would go ahead and stick these coals on top of their their head, and they would carry that in a bowl. And here's the, the passage there. Carry that in a bowl on their heads, and it would be as a symbol of their penitence and their regret for doing what they've done. So we should use deeds of love to turn the enemy into a friend. Whatever translation or interpretation you go with, this right here is the important point that Paul is making. To me, I kind of think of it as like, regardless of how cruel someone treats you and the wrongs they put against you, seeking revenge is not going to make it any better. And it's going to show that you're not really living according to what God has said. Like, he wants us to love each other and revenge isn't going to do that. So, by showing kindness towards them and leaving it up to God, it, uh... It kind of like, that's like the sacrifice there is like going against doing the same awful thing that they're doing because you trust God and what he'll do with it. I definitely agree with that. That is good. It seems like that's what this entire passage is about really is uh, sort of loving your enemies and kind of stepping over the bounds of what the world expects of or expects from you. So that's chapter 12. I'm going to take a sip of water because I am talking a lot. <clears throat> All right, we move on then. To chapter 13, with all of that practical advice in mind, and we're going to talk about how we should act under the government then, and what we should do with the civil authorities, also our attitude towards people in general, and then we're going to talk about living in the light. So first of all, just so I don't wear my voice out, I'm not going to read this this whole chapter, and thankfully it's only 14 verses. You can pause the the video here and go ahead and read that for yourself if you like. But we'll start in with verse 1 there. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except by God, and those that exist are put in place by God. So I think this is quite important here. There's a couple different ways you can take this, in fact. You can say, all right, government is in place of God, I should obey them insofar as they don't force me to disobey God. That's one part, one way you can take it. The other way you can take it as you can look at this as conditional authority, conditional divine authority. And it's conditional on the fact so long as they do good. Verse 3 there, 
For rulers are not a cause of terror for good deed, but for bad conduct. So do you want to be afraid of authority? So you do, do you not want to be afraid of authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from it. For it is God's servant for you for what is good. But if you do what is bad, be afraid because it does not bear the sword to no purpose. For it is God's servant, the one who avenges for punishment on the one who does what is bad. So the second view you can take is that, well, obeying the authority and governing civil magistrates is conditional on if they actually punish the bad people and reward the good. But if they don't do that, if they're a tyrannical government, for example, and they're oppressing good people and rewarding the bad people, then you can disobey them. And some people take this even further to say that you can revolt against them. You can start a rebellion and fight against them. And one example is the American Revolution seceding from the, the British powers because they believed Britain to be a tyrannical government at the time. And so they believed that they had the right then to, to secede and rebel against that. And that's what people usually, how people usually justify that. I personally don't know much about history, so I, I'd rather not comment on it. But my personal view, just because we don't have anyone here, is that I believe that the, the American Revolution was not in accordance to chapter 13 here because it tells us to be subject to the governing authorities and even before that in the previous context that i believe is important it says bless those who persecute you and bless those who persecute in general so a tyrannical government they persecute instead of revolting and rebelling against them bless them instead and keep in mind that do not take revenge for yourselves Dear friends, but give place to God's wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. God is sovereign, and there is no authority except by God. This is a little clearer in the ESV, for there is no authority except from God, meaning that those that exist have been instituted by God. So God chooses which authorities to put into place, and you know who are we to say that God isn't calling for us to be punished, isn't calling us for to suffer a little bit so that we can rejoice in our sufferings as the previous chapters of Romans tell us to do. Rejoice in your sufferings because, you know, it produces good character and so on. It gives you this opportunity to be a martyr for his cause. Now, I'm not saying that we should just, you know, completely sit back and or even affirm all the bad things that the government is doing. Of course not. You know, even Jesus spoke out against the governing authorities and civil magistrates of his day, but he did die at their hands and he submitted to that even wrongful punishment. And you could look at that as an extraordinary example. Yes, Jesus was only doing that so that he could, you know, save the world of their, of their sins. And it was extraordinary in that sense. But we can also bring out other examples as well, such as Paul. He was always very subject to the government. The government wanted to flog him for no good reason and on the account of false witnesses and testimonies. Yes, he would give a good account for himself, but he, he wouldn't start slashing people up with a sword or anything like that. He would submit to being flogged. I also want to point out that when I say submit, and especially in verse, thir verse 1 there, chapter 13, being subject to, this does not mean well, it doesn't necessarily mean to obey everything that the governing authority tells you to do. The Greek word there is simply being, well, submitting to and subjecting yourself to. It's a positional place where you respect the someone's authority and respect someone and honor them. And I just want to point out that the same Greek word there is used in Ephesians 5.21, being subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. So it would not make sense for me to obey everything that my Christian fellows say. And it wouldn't make sense for all my Christian fellows to obey everything that I say either. Instead, this is just about submitting to one another as we do in Christ, brothers and sisters, to one another. And the same Greek word is used in 13.1. So that's how I would, I would take that. And you're, of course, 
free to disagree. I'm sure we could think of other examples as well, maybe those under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament and see how they acted. We could look at Daniel and how he acted. So the question is, where do we draw this line? How do we know we can disobey the government? Well, another good example that I would like to point out is Jesus's part, part for us, where he tells us, I think Matthew chapter 5, he says, to the one who forces you to go one mile and, and carry his, his stuff, go with him an extra mile, a second mile. So I think the word force there is really important because, well, this was not very consensual and you're being forced to do something. But the second mile is voluntary. So these authorities, if they force you to do something, you can go ahead and do it so long as it doesn't entail you disobeying God in some way. But not only that, even more, go with them the second mile. Even if, you know, they have no right to force you to walk a mile and carry their stuff, even if they're mean to you, even if they're tyrannical or oppressive, go ahead and walk that extra mile anyway. Some other examples that people would use on the other side, let me just take a sip of water real quick, is that we see a number of examples in the book of Acts, especially. So in Acts, a number of disciples, a number of times, actually, they get imprisoned. But God breaks them out of jail and tells them to go ahead and, you know, praise his name, evangelize, and speak his word out in the public square and wherever they are. So he breaks them out of jail. And there's also one specific time where an angel comes out specifically and tells them, all right, I've broken you out of jail. Let's get out of here and continue evangelizing. And one important quote is important here. I could probably find this somewhere. I think it's in the, the commentary. It's some quote in Acts. Yeah, Acts 5.29. But Peter and the apostles answered and said, it is necessary to obey God rather than men. So the context here is that they are sequestering the disciples and stopping them from evangelizing and stopping them from obeying God. <clears throat> and of course, you should always obey God rather than men. So don't take verse 1 there as a sweeping generalization for everything without looking at anything else in the Bible. That would be like going to the United States and saying, this is the land of freedom. Therefore, I am free to rob, steal, and murder however I like because I am free. And that would be a sweeping generalization, a, a fallacy of very terrible proportions and consequences. So instead of doing that, you have to be aware that there are, there are laws in the United States and they have laws against stealing and murdering people. So same here, don't take this as a sweeping generalization. And the other side is, you know, where do you draw that line? So on the 529 quote, and on the examples that we have of God breaking these people out of jail and telling them to witness, my response would be that, well, hey, these are extraordinary events, right? If you are in jail and you have the option to bust out of there, well, is God telling you to, to bust out of there and preach his word? Has an angel arrived and specifically told you what to do? And if you don't have those things, then I guess my recommendation would simply to be, you know, stay in jail if we're going with that example. Because somewhere in chapter 16, I believe, yep, here we go. We have another example of a couple apostles, a couple disciples in jail here. So there's the context if you want to read that. So after casting out this demon, they are then thrown into jail. And let's see here, they're in a prison. And we'll go through and look at verse 25 onwards. And here we go. Verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and all bonds were unfastened. The jailer <laughs> was apparently falling asleep there. So he woke up, he's about to kill himself because he let all the prisoners get away. But Paul called out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself for we are all here. So they actually stayed in the prison here. They 
didn't receive word from God to get out of the prison or break out and go against the civil authorities, even though they were wrongfully imprisoned, just like in the previous examples, they were wrongfully imprisoned, but they didn't have any extraordinary insights or revelation from God to bust out of there and run out, even though God you know, made the earthquake happen, broke their bonds, opened everything up. They still stayed there. So that is my response to those other examples, and I'm sure we could find some more. So if you are interested, I would encourage you to look at some examples from Nebuchadnezzar with Israelites under Babylonian captivity and see how they acted there. And I think Daniel is also a great example of that as well. David is also a great example too, especially when he was being chased by Saul, who was the ruling authority at that time. And we see that even though Saul was trying to kill him, so not just merely little oppression, little tyranny here and there, Saul was actively pursuing David and trying to kill him, but David still did not retaliate by killing him. Now, this is not to say that I don't believe in, in self-defense and things like that, especially on a personal level, but that's a discussion for a later date. So we looked a little bit about the first part of chapter 13 there, the ruling authorities. Pay taxes to whom taxes are due, pay customs due to those who are due. And then Paul goes on and says, all right, pay respect to whom respect is due and pay honor to whom honor is due. First pay taxes, now respect and honor. And keep in mind that all of these authorities here have been delegated their authority directly by God. Now that's not to say that they are divine authorities in, in a sense that you should obey their absolute every command and word and everything like that, but they have delegated authority. However, they are human, they are fallible, so that they can misuse and abuse that authority. So just keep that in mind. Pretty interesting stuff. Free to disagree, but I would recommend that you look at the examples that we have out elsewhere in Scripture as to how we should act towards authority, even those that oppress and persecute us. So let's move on to our attitude toward people now. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. And I think this is because we have this debt of love from God who has loved us so much that we could never repay it. And we also should have love to one another. For the one who loves someone has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, murder, steal, covet. And if there is any other commandment, they're summed up in this one statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So that is very interesting there. That's pretty much the big fulfillment of the law right there. Love does not commit evil against a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So I think Paul connects these two things here because the law is all about not committing evil against a neighbor. So if you do have love, if you do love your neighbor, then you are fulfilling the law. And do this because you know the time. And now we're talking about living in the light here. Do this because you know the time that it is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep. For our salvation is nearer now than when we believed. And when Paul talks about salvation in this context, at least sometimes he talks about it as a, as a past or current event. But in this context, when he says salvation, he has in mind God's judgment, God's eschatological wrath. So day of judgment type of stuff. And salvation in this context is salvation from the day of judgment. And he also puts in this sense of urgency here that is very common in scripture. So always act like it is near because it is. It is near. We're, we're in that age. So always act. Always be awake, so to speak. And he's, he's giving us that sense of urgency because you know, we've apparently been, been sleeping and, and falling asleep at the handle there. So our salvation is nearer than when we believed. When we usually think of the word salvation, we kind of think of, all right, you know, we've, it's something in kind of the present tense. Ha we ask this question, have you been saved? Or we say, I have salvation. 
But Paul here is, is talking about, you know, future tense salvation from God's wrath. So it's important to note the, the little distinction there, but Paul also uses it in the present tense as well sometimes. So he says, the night is far gone and the day has drawn near, which is some of the imagery used in this context, day, sunlight, things like that. Therefore, let us throw off the deeds of darkness and put on the weapons of light. Some translations say armor of light. Instead, the Greek oplon there can basically mean, and I'll just pull up a gloss real quick. So the Greek oplon can mean an implement, arms, armor, weapons, whether offensive or defensive. So it can mean either. And I believe the ESV uses, yep, ESV translates that as armor of light. And I don't know which translation I'd go on. I think it's not that important. The important thing, of course, is that we're in battle. We're not supposed to be sleeping, but we're in battle. So we should put on these implements of battle, whether it's a weapon or an armor. I think armor is a little more consistent with Paul because he talks about the armor of God a lot in his other letters. And he talks about the breastplate of righteousness in a number of specific places as well. So I think armor would might fit a little better as far as Paul goes. I'm going to take another sip of water here. All right, so we're supposed to be preparing for battle here. So enough sleeping, prepare for battle. And here are some final words from Paul. Let us live decently as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and licentiousness, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and do not make provision for the desires of the flesh. And that is living in the light, that little section there. So it's easy to, you know, go through Bible studies and study the Bible and gain more knowledge and become more intellectual and learn more about the Bible, which is great and everything like that. But it's not only about that. When you read the Bible, it shouldn't just expand your knowledge. It should also change your life. And I think that concept is extremely important to Paul because in Romans and a few of his other letters, he concludes them with this large section on application. And this is exactly how you change your life by reading the word. You take all of this into account and you apply that specifically to your life, to specific ev events. And I think that's a really amazing thing with Paul because usually people think of Paul as, you know, this intellectual person. He is all about theology and doctrine. But they're not thinking about all these other chapters we have of Paul, which are all about application. It's all about Christian living and such specific advice, too, that's still applicable today that we can use for ourselves. And so in concluding this Bible study, I would just like to encourage you to go ahead and read through chapters 12 and 13 again and even even write a list of all the specific things that you can do to follow some of these commandments and these these things Paul gives us on how a Christian should live. Love must be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Be attached to what is good, for example. How do you do that in your in your own life? You know, write down specific examples. Maybe there's someone in your life who you've been hypocritical towards and condemning them for a sin that you yourself do as well. Maybe you haven't been abhorring some sort of evil in your life, and maybe you could be attached more to what is good. So what is good? You know, what are some good things that you can do in your life, and how can you be devoted to your fellow brother and sister in brotherly love and esteeming another person more highly in honor and all these other things as well? So I would like to finally conclude this Bible study with a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads in reverence. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this wonderful day that you've given us. And even though the, the internet cut out and we lost our, our group, I pray that you can still use this Bible study to good, though. I pray that you do have, that we can trust in your plan, that even though we don't know what this might benefit, that it has purpose that you will use this for your good, Lord, and that you will bring good out of the terrible evil that is internet lag and, and disconnection. I pray, Lord, that you can bless our lives with these chapters, that you can change our lives with these chapters as well, and that we'll be able to take these 
these verses into our hearts and into our lives and show that love to everyone else and fulfill the law by loving our neighbor as ourselves. And I thank you, Lord, for this wonderful time. I pray that everybody who is currently in the Bible study voice chat right now with better internet than I do, I pray that they're also learning a lot about practical application and what your word has to say for their lives. Pray all of this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.